he's losing it. He doesn't know how to go on. He feels miserable all the time. He's getting more and more depressed. He should be happy and he blames it on society. It's inauthentic. It's what society expects of people and it's not what I want. So although I have it all, I might as well just not have it. All right, welcome everyone to this new video. Today I'm going to talk about Hermann Hesse, Der Steppenwolf. Many people have heard about it, few people have actually read it. I read it about 30 years ago when I was 17 and I didn't really get it. I mean, I understood the story, what it was about, but it didn't really resonate with me. I was just too young. And then I had to do a talk about the book last year and I reread it. And so after 30 years, the book has taken on a totally new meaning for me and I was immediately able to relate to it. Now this video is going to be very long, so I'm going to split it up in different segments. Today I want to focus on Hermann Hesse, the author himself, his background, what motivated him to write, what were his books basically about, how was his personal life, and how did he deal with all his many, many problems. I know right now the notion that the author doesn't exist is very predominant, postmodernist concept. I don't really believe that the author doesn't exist. I think the author is very important to understand his or her literature. So I'm more like a Bactinian in that respect because I think the author is located in the center of the text. I don't think the text writes itself. I don't think texts just generate text. I think the author is very important in the process of actually writing a text and organizing the materials that he or she uses in order to express a certain meaning. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about Hermann Hesse, his childhood, how he grew up and his adult life. So in the beginning, I want to show you the cover of an early edition of Der Steppenwolf. It's very important because it already summarizes the main theme of the book. So we see a man standing there and uh, that's the protagonist of the novel is called Harry Hala. The name is also very significant for the story and the connection between the protagonist and Hermann Hesse, the author, and his shadow becomes a wolf. Now, it's very important because the shadow is the major, major motif in Hermann Hesse's novel. So he picks up the Jungian notion that we all have a shadow that we have to face eventually, otherwise we will be eaten by it. So the thing is, how do you confront the shadow? Well, most importantly, you have to turn around and face it. And then, and only then, will you be able to finally destroy it. The problem is you have to be aware of the shadow in the first place. So this takes some introspection. So you have to basically climb down into the abyss of yourself. And this is what the whole novel is about and is fascinating. So to start things off, I want to show you a poem. And this poem is at the beginning of the novel and it sets the tone for the whole story. I'm going to show you the original German poem and it's basically, it's hypertexting another poem and that poem is by a very, very famous German philosopher. And who that philosopher is, I'm going to reveal at the end of my video series. So first of all, here's the poem. I'm going to read it to you and translate it for you. Ich Steppenwolf trabe und trabe. Die Welt liegt voll Schnee. Vom Birkenbaumflügel der Rabe, aber nirgends ein Hase, nirgends ein Reh. In die Rehe bin ich so verliebt, wenn ich doch eins fände. Ich nehme es in die Zähne, in die Hände. Das ist das Schönste, was es gibt. Ich wäre der Holden so von Herzen gut, fräße mich tief in ihre zärtlichen Keulen. Tränke mich satt an ihrem hellroten Blut, um nachher die ganze Nacht einsam zu heulen. Sogar mit einem Hasen war ich zufrieden, Süß schmeckt sein warmes Fleisch in der Nacht. Ach, ist denn alles von mir geschieden, was das Leben ein bisschen fröhlicher macht? An meinem Schwanz ist das Haar schon grau, auch kann ich nicht mehr ganz deutlich sehen. Und nun trabe ich und träume von Rehen, trabe und träume von Hasen, höre den Wind in der Winternacht blasen, tränke mit Schnee meine brennende Kehle, trage dem Teufel zu, meine arme Seele. Harry Haller All right, so he says, Ich Steppenwolf trabe und trabe. I am the Steppenwolf, I'm trotting and trotting. The world is full of snow. There's a raven flying up from a tree, but I can't see a rabbit anywhere, and there's no deer anywhere. 
I'm so in love with those deer. If I only could find one, I would take it in my teeth, take it in my hands. That's the most beautiful thing there is. I would be very good to that beautiful creature. I would sink my teeth in her tender thighs. I would drink her bright red blood just to cry in loneliness the whole night. So he's basically killing her. And that's very important. So finding the object of your desire, but then following your animalistic impulses and basically devouring her. I would be satisfied even just with a rabbit. The rabbit's flesh tastes sweet and warm in the night. Alexander Alice von Megasheden, has everything been separated from me? Has everything left me? Everything that makes my life a little bit more bearable. I'm am Schwanz ist harsch und grau. My tail is already gray. Auch kann ich nicht mehr ganz deutlich sehen. And my eyesight is also not good. I can't really see. And now I'm trotting. And I'm dreaming of deer. I'm trotting and I'm dreaming of rabbits. I hear the wind blow in the winter night. And I drink the snow to quench my thirst. And I'm carrying my soul towards the devil. Harry Haller. So Harry Hala is the protagonist of the story. And, um, and he writes that poem because in the story, Harry Hala is also a writer. Very important. And it's not a coincidence that his name is Harry Hala because same initials as Hermann Hesse. So basically it's his alter ego. So we have this loneliness motif, this endless trotting around, not having a home and basically not knowing where to go. Another major theme is eternal life. So if you actually could have eternal life, wouldn't it be more like a punishment? Because you would never be able to leave this place, to leave this sad, lonely, and dreadful human existence. Now, anyway, I want to talk about Hesse's background. He was born in 1877 in the southwest of Germany in a very, very tiny place called Kalf. And in 1946, he received the Nobel Prize for Literature for his book Das Glasperlenspiel. Not for the Steppenwolf, which I find a little tragic. Uh, I've read Das Glasperlenspiel and I am not really the biggest fan of it, but maybe it was also too long ago, so I might reread it and probably change my mind. But to my mind, the Steppenwolf is still his best and most important work. Uh, in 1962, Hesse died in Montagnola in Switzerland. So he was 85 years old, had a pretty long life, but it doesn't mean that he had a very good life. That's Hermann Hesse himself. Like any writer, any philosopher, he only have photographs from when he was older. You know, you just can't imagine that these people have ever actually been young or even babies. So we have this kind of like dignified older gentleman a very renowned, world-famous writer and artist. So this is where he comes from. That's his home village. And it just looks like a classic German village, kind of like this old vibe that there is. You know, you have the forest and then you have a river and these pretty houses. And um, yeah, like medieval kind of architecture. And that's where Hesse grew up. The problem is he hated it. Why did he hate it? Because to his mind, it was just so boring to grow up in this picturesque postcard world. And it was just so narrow and there was nothing to stimulate his imagination. So when he was very young, he already started to daydream about exotic places he could travel to, just to leave this dreadful little village behind that was just so limiting for his goals and for his aspirations, for his imagination and everything basically. So he just was not happy there. His parents are very interesting. They were missionaries and they were in India for many years. And they always told their son all these stories about this exotic place, you know, their religion, and they have so many different gods that they worship. And the food was just totally different. And then, of course, the people, the culture, everything was just the exact opposite of Germany, basically. You know, with their Christian religion and there's only one God and, you know, just what you eat in Germany, only eat bread. You have breakfast, it's bread. Lunch, it's bread. Dinner, it's bread, 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 bread. So that's basically it. So it's a very, very simple, frugal lifestyle. So he has heard these stories and he said, well, India, that sounds fascinating. If this is the exact opposite of Germany, that's where I want to be. I want to be here. So I just want to leave. The problem is, of course, he was very young, probably four years old, five years old. And that's when he started to read. 
His father had many books, and as soon as Hesse could read, he was just immersed in this world of literature and exotic places, adventure novels, and that's where he wanted to be. That was like food for his imagination. And from a very, very early age, he hated this German, let's say, the normality of German life. It was just something that he did not want. You know, the boredom. You work a job. So it's like this lifestyle that is just so regular. And he could not imagine to ever do something like that. And that's why he became an artist in the first place. His mother kind of realized that her son is very smart. And he's also very artistic. The problem is that she also realized that her son is very stubborn. And if you let him do whatever he wants, it's no problem. And he's very good at learning everything and quick-witted. But he also has a dark side. So basically what she saw was that if they don't raise their son right and limit his, let's say, his personality a bit and kind of like direct it towards something more positive, he would become a monster. So she saw that her son was an egomaniac. And that's basically what he was throughout his whole life. So he was kind of self-centered and he was stubborn. And um, also, of course, a bit narcissistic. So his mother emphasized that his energy has to be channeled to something very productive, but also something positive, because Hesse was also prone to uh, depressive fits at that time. And uh, this was something that like, uh, he was suffering all his life from uh, depression and anxiety. And um, so his mother saw, yeah, we have to kind of like uh, take good care of him and let's just limit his energy in some way, because otherwise he might become a criminal. When he was four years old, uh, his parents moved to Basel. Basel is a very small city in Switzerland. And um, he went to school there and he hated school. So he changed schools very, very many times because he was not able to just sit there and listen to the teacher. That was just so boring to him. And uh, he just could not imagine just not to do what he himself wanted to do. So he had problems with authority. And this is just what his mother saw when he was very, very little. So he had a very hard time in school. He liked to read and he liked to, you know, write little poems and live in his own world. So he was also kind of like, an individualist, and he was a loner too. So he didn't have many friends, or probably no friends at all. He was just kind of like self-centered and just happy in his own imagination. And at the age of 14, he became severely depressed, and he was considering suicide. And his father saw that. What can I do? Or probably it's just a phase, you know, it's puberty, and it's just gonna go away. But when he was 15, in 1892, Hesse somehow got a gun and tried to kill him with it. Of course, he failed. But his father locked him up in an insane asylum. And Hesse got even more depressed in there, of course. And he wrote a letter to his father. And in his letter, he accused his father of all the bad things he might do when he grows up. So if I become a criminal, if I become a killer, that's your fault. That's not my fault. It's you who did that. So it was basically threatening his father. Anyway, so when he got out, it didn't get any better. So this depression was there all of his life. And what he did, he blamed the world for his problems. He blamed the world for his state of mind because he thought the world is an inauthentic place. No one understands me. Nobody. Hesse comes from the Romanticist tradition. So the Romanticists, the German Romanticists, had this concept of the original genius, the original genie. It's like... You realize yourself that from an early age, you already are different because you're a genius, you're an artist. So the world's rules, the world's laws, they don't apply to you because you are special. That's what has a thought. And so he said, I don't care about the society. The society is bad. The society is sick and it makes me sick. The society doesn't accept me for who I am. So I don't want to have anything to do with this fake, Christian, inauthentic society. It's like a coming-of-age thing, and many of Hesse's novels, they deal with that theme. It's like a bit, you know, like J.D. Salinger, Catcher in the Rye. The world is phony, and everything is fake. No one is telling you the truth. Everyone is just pretending. This was also Hesse's feeling. Anyway, so he turns against his parents because his parents embody this fake world that he rejects. And because his parents are, of course, missionaries, Hesse turns against Christianity. Instead, he turns to the Far East. He becomes fascinated with Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism. 
And this is very important because some of his later books, they deal with these themes. So he also wants to leave school for good, but his father doesn't let him. So instead, Hesse, he continues and he's struggling. He hates school. He hates all the subject. Why do I need math? I am an artist. I only want to write. So I don't really care what I learned there. There's nothing they could teach me anyway. So in 1893, he just quit school. And his father is not amused and he says, well, if you quit school, you have to start to work. So I said, yeah, but I don't really, I'm not really fit, you know, for any job. So I'm just going to be an artist. That's okay. So what kind of artist do you want to be anyway? I want to be a writer. I want to be a poet. And his father said, well, you know, I have a good idea. You like books, right? So his father got him a job in a bookstore. <laughs> so Hesse had to do an apprenticeship selling books in a bookstore. Has said, this is not what I want. I am going to write books, my own books, and they will help me sell my books, but I'm not going to work there and sell other people's books. So has said, he was so, so mad about this. As I see, that's exactly it. Yeah, no one understands me. So he spent a few weeks there and basically didn't do anything, but he started to get motivated to actually start writing for real. So because his father locked him up in that place, in that bookstore, and forced him to learn how to sell books, basically, has to say, yeah, I'm just going to prove to him that I am an artist. So he started writing and writing little poems, short stories, and then he actually sent them to some magazines and they were published. So I said, see, in your face, I am a writer. And now it's official. So he quit. I'm just going to pursue this. So he wrote some more stuff and it's also got published. And then finally, he realized, well, actually, because he got paid for it, um, so I can do this uh, to make money for a living. So I can be independent. He was kind of like hooked. He was just obsessed with writing stuff. And then finally he published his first novel, Peter Kamenzind. That was like 1904 and 1906. He had a very famous novel, Unterm Rad, Under the Wheel. And these novels, they were bestsellers. People loved them, especially young people. Because what Hessen was writing there was all about young people struggling to find their place in society, in a society that rejects them, that doesn't understand them. So it's all these coming of age books, you know, puberty, struggling with who I am, what I want. So what does society have to offer me? Why does no one understand me? Why is it so inauthentic everywhere? And young people, they loved it. It's like, he's writing about me. That's me. That's my struggle. So I'm not the only one then. Very good. So many people felt understood. It has to become kind of like an icon of uh, coming of age literature. In 1904, he also married a young actress and they had three sons. So right now, he's an accomplished author. He's married. He's got three sons. He's got a house. He's got many people's admiration. So he has everything he ever wanted. And he felt awful. He felt miserable the whole time. So all these material goods, all the things that society basically tells him, that's what you need and you can feel complete. And they made him feel more and more depressed. And that this can't be. So probably these things are not for me. Probably it's just something you know, that people assume to be essential to become happy. Well, I'm not happy. So what can I do? And yeah. So his depression got worse. So basically, he's losing it. He doesn't know how to go on. He feels miserable all the time. He's getting more and more depressed. He should be happy. And he blames it on society. It's inauthentic. It's what society expects of people. And it's not what I want. So although I have it all, but I might as well just not have it. So he always feels this void. He's got fame. He's got money. He's got possessions. He's got everything he always wanted to have. 
or basically everything he always thought he wanted to have. And now that he has it all, he realizes it doesn't matter because it doesn't change who I am inside. So you can throw all the money you want into this void. It's not going to fill it. You can throw all your possessions in that void. It's not going to fill it. So it's always there. So he said, I, I got to go. And he's thinking, what's the one thing I've always wanted to do since I was a kid? The one dream I always had, India. So he travels to India for a couple of months. He goes to India. He goes to Indonesia. He does research on Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism. There might be something in there that we don't have in our own Western religious system. And he gets the inspiration for his famous novel, Siddhartha. It's about the life of Buddha. It became a classic uh, during the hippie era. And uh, it's still one of Hesse's most famous books. Anyway, so he spends time there and then he comes back. And when he comes back, he finds out, well, just the same old dread again. And then he kind of realizes, wait, Maybe running away from these things that I think are holding me down, that's not the answer because I'm running away. I'm still taking me with me. So I think my problem is on the inside. And so what do you do when you realize that? You look for help. The problem is right now, there's a bigger problem. It's the First World War in 1914 the First World War breaks out and Hesse criticizes it. Hesse says, this is a wrong war. It should not be fought. Germany should stop immediately. At that time, many Germans were patriots and they thought this war was just because Germany was wrongfully attacked. Hesse didn't think so. Uh, but his readers, they were really mad at him. And some people say, well, I don't want to read his books anymore. I don't want anything to do with that author because he opposes this patriotic war. Hesse has no patriotism. He's not a nationalist. Of course not. I mean, basically, he's a Steppenwolf, so he's running around this world. He has no home. He has no place. How could you support your country if you don't feel it's your country? So that's what you try to articulate. But many people thought he was just mean and unthankful. And he owed his readers to support their country too. As I said, I'm not going to do it. No, this war is not my war. It should not be fought. Okay. And what happened? He got more depressed. And so the more depressed he got, the more he thought, I probably need professional help. He was in Switzerland. And the most famous Swiss psychologist at that time was Carl Gustav Jung. So Hesse became one of Jung's patients. He went to therapy at one-on-one -on -one sessions with Jung, and then he had group therapy, and Jung told him to keep a diary. Hesse started. So just exploring his soul, basically. Just like climbing down into the abyss of his soul and trying to find something, because this might be where his problems are located. And then he learned about Jung's shadow concept and was fascinated. He said, oh, this is it. And slowly, like a story took shape in his diary. And this story became Der Steppenwolf. So basically it's a soul diary. So Hesse wrote it and he presented it to Jung in his group therapy sessions. So this kind of like turned out to become his most famous novel. The thing is, it took many years to write and actually has the situation worsened. In 1919, he was alone again and he was living in his house, which basically was a palace. It was huge. He was there and basically what he did, he was still trying to kind of find the tone of the novel. He was taking long walks. Uh, he was just not eating much, also drinking a lot, of course. And so he spend most of his time outside painting. And here are some paintings. So it's just like, so that's just the landscape he was observing and was just painting it. Kind of relaxed him. It just to kind of slowly put paint on the canvas, this process, like repetitive, but it's kind of like meditative too, just to calm him down. 
and he was still in therapy, um, the Steppenwolf slowly took shape. What Hesse learned in Jung's therapy was that the shadow is an essential part of the human soul. If you don't confront the shadow, the shadow will basically devour you. It will consume you. And so, but you first have to find it. That's the problem. So that's why you have to descend into your own soul. And it's a dangerous process because what you find there might not be pretty. And it's going to scare the hell out of you. The problem is you can't look away. You can't run away because the shadow will follow you. You have to turn around and face it. Otherwise, it will always control you. So, and that became like a major part of the Steppenwolf. As he did all these things with therapy and his novel was slowly coming together. And um, in 1927, he published it. 1927 is a very significant year for Germany at that time. So the Weimar Republic until about 1925 was a total mess. It was chaos. People didn't have any money. There was hyperinflation. People were unemployed. Uh, no one was sure about their future. It was uncertainty. But then it changed. Suddenly, society was doing better. And people had hope again. And people were also hungry for life. The arts were flourishing. And it was just that Berlin was like the second Paris, basically. And it was jazz music, it was nightlife, there was everything, any kind of enjoyment you could imagine. But there was also this feeling of disorientation. In 1927, another famous book was published. It's Martin Heidegger, Sein und Zeit, Being and Time. I will talk about Heidegger and Sein und Zeit and his uh, criticism of contemporary society later in a later video. So when Hesse criticized the inauthenticity of contemporary society, Heidegger does something very similar. Heidegger observed that contemporary society has lost its self-awareness, that people have lost their consciousness. They are not aware that they exist. And the worst thing is people try to ignore death. In Heidegger's thought, it's very important to realize that there is no life without death. Death gives life meaning because being is being in time. And time ultimately leads being into death. So basically human existence is being towards death, is living towards death. And once you ignore death, you cannot have an authentic life a life of self-awareness, a conscious life. That's very important. And at that time, like the golden 20s, they slowly faded into 1933 and ultimately ended in National Socialism. So this is what I wanted to talk about today. In my next video, I'm going to talk about the novel itself, its structure, the different characters that appear, their significance, what their names mean, and of course, like what has they wanted to express, what's the major themes in the story. And I will present some sections of the text and give you a brief analysis. So thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.